Hello everybody. I am going to talk about a beautiful, lovely, strong, powerful, admirable woman, Virginia Woolf. We all love her. That photo is so beautiful, isn't it? She's so wonderful. Not only to look at, brilliant writer. Oh my God, what an intellectual. The way she writes her uh, prose, non-fiction essays, the way she writes her novels. By God, such a wonderful writer, a very major modernist. Virginia Woolf was born in the same year as James Joyce, 1882. She committed suicide in 1941. Virginia Woolf was the daughter of Leslie Stephen. He was also a, a writer, a man of letters. And she married Leonard Woolf. He worked in the Ceylon civil service here in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. Wow, that was before their marriage. Virginia had a sister, Vanessa. And beautiful names, now Virginia and Vanessa. Wow. They had two brothers, Adrian and Toby. Oh, Toby died and Virginia was really depressed because of that. Vanessa, Toby, they were all associated with Virginia in the Bloomsbury group. Leonard Wolf, Virginia Wolf, Vanessa, her husband Clive Bell, then our E.M. Foster, Lytton Strachey, the artist Roger Fry, the economist John Maynard Keynes. All of them were part of the Bloomsbury group. They're, they were an informal group of friends, relatives, lovers, who were all intellectuals, partly modernists. And they all met at Cambridge University. And uh, they together did not write any book, but they were all influenced by G.E. Moore's Principia Ethica. Very important text that inspired many modernists. Now, Virginia Woolf was uh, an upper class English woman. She showed a lot of Englishness in character. But at the same time, she was critical of Victorianism and Englishness. Both were there. Virginia wrote a kind of fiction that became the hallmark of modernism. Characters who are lonely, trapped in relationship, not knowing how to make sense of their life, living in a metropolis but not being able to belong to it. Themes of love, friendship, art, all intermingle in these novels. She kind of ignores external reality. She even criticized contemporaries like John Galsworthy and Arnold Bennett for focusing too much on social reality. Instead, Virginia, James Joyce, etc. focused on the character, on relationships. She believed that a novel should depict character. A novel is not meant to preach. I will read out. There is a famous quotation. It is not to preach doctrines, sing songs, or celebrate the glories of the British Empire. That is not what a novel is for. Virginia's ideas regarding novels she wrote in modern fiction. That is one of the essays where she attacked the materialism of Galsworthy and Bennett. She called herself and James Joyce spiritualists because they focused on the spirit, on the character. Her early novels are not very modernist. Her later novels or middle novels are very modernist, very impressionistic. That means focusing on the impressions of characters, employing experimental techniques, and also delving deep into character analysis and personal consciousness. As you might know, Virginia Woolf employed the stream of consciousness technique. Before Virginia Woolf, Dorothy Richardson had already used stream of consciousness. Stream of consciousness is a flow of the character's thoughts and impressions without structure, without spelling or grammar. Just thoughts flowing like that in an ungrammatic prose. 
James Joyce also used it. Virginia Woolf's first novel was The Voyage Out. The Voyage Out is otherwise titled Melimbrosia. It came in the year 1915. And uh, did you know guys, The Voyage Out introduces a very famous character. Can you guess it? One character that you know from another novel is there in Voyage Out. Turn it and tell me. I am waiting. Clarissa Dalloway, the protagonist of Mrs. Dalloway, appears for the first time in Voyage Out. Other early novels are Night and Day. They are all Voyage Out and Night and Day are conventional novels. At this time, she wrote a lot of short stories also. Her husband, Leonard Wolf and Virginia, together founded the Hogarth Press. There, many of her books were also published. And then in the 1920s, started the experimental novels, modernist novels, with the 1922 novel, Jacob's Room. Uh, it is the first of Virginia's modernist novels, experimental novels. It shows a young man, Jacob, who is Jacob Flanders, that is his real name, who is involving with uh, relationships in the society in the pre-World War era. He is confused and ambiguous in his relationship with people and past. And slowly, his confusions and insecurities are unraveled before us. Finally, he enters the First World War and probably dies there. The interesting part of the novel is that it is not Jacob who is telling the story. We are not looking at it from his perspective. We are looking at it from the perspectives of the women in his life, including his mother. So the women in Jacob's life are talking about Jacob in the form of a Bildungs Roman. They are talking about the development of the character. But uh, it is not plot oriented. It is, associ it is more centered on the character. The development of the character. You, can you ever know somebody's character completely? Will your perceptions of character will be true and complete? That is a very important issue here. How far can you trust the views of the other people. Is it the reality of Jacob that they are talking about? Is there something called the reality of Jacob? These are questions in the novel. The novel is full of fragmented narratives, letters, conversations, reflections, all of which actually reveal the impossibility of communication. You can't communicate properly. You can't know a person properly. Jacob is an interesting character. In D.H. Lawrence's novel, The Rainbow, there is a paralleling of the character's development with the development of the society. From a pre-modern England, there is a development to modern England. And there is also here, a development like that. Jacob's development as a, an individual reveals the change over from a pre-modern to a modern Europe. Jacob immerses himself in the past. He is enamored of Greek history. He is completely immersed in the past. But slowly he realizes that the present is different, but he cannot escape the present. He has to immerse in the present as well. That is why he takes part in the First World War and disappears there. At the end of the novel, his mother and some others are cleaning out his room. Jacob's room is the title, remember? And throwing out some of his things, including a pair of old shoes. That is the last words. Those are the last words in the novel. A pair of old shoes. 
It is said that Jacob's character is modeled on Virginia's brother Toby's character. So this is a very important novel by Virginia Woolf. Next came Mrs. Dalloway, 1925. Clarissa Dalloway, whom we met first in Voyage Out, appears here. She is a central character. As all of you might know, she uh, is going to throw a party at the beginning of the novel. Clarissa is going to give a party and she's going out to London to buy flowers and other things. As she walks in London, we see the crowds, we see the busy life in London and she's not able to identify with it. She doesn't belong to that crowd. We see through her reflections, her relationships, her husband, her daughter. She had a, an admirer before, Peter Walsh, who on this day is meeting her again. So many people that we meet in the pages of the novel who represent the diversity of London life, the diversity of perspectives. In the middle of all this, Clarissa is lonely. There is politics, there are personal issues, love, relationships. Now, paralleling Cl Clarissa's character, there is a war veteran, Septimus Warren Smith. He's a very sensitive man. And he is under mental depression, shell shock. That is the depression you get after you fight in the war and see trauma. And uh, Septimus Warren Smith is being taken care of by Rizia or Lucrezia, his Italian wife. There are two doctors who are ready to take care of Septimus, Dr. Holmes, a medical practitioner and Sir William, the psychiatrist. These characters are all important and in the party, during the party, it is announced, uh, Clarissa hears that Septimus Warren Smith jumped from his window and committed suicide because he did not want to be taken to the asylum. He did not want to give in his soul to the medical people and at the culmination of all the events of that day, when Clarissa hears this, Clarissa feels like she is responsible for that death. Now Septimus is a war veteran. How is Clarissa responsible? But she feels a kind of collective guilt. She feels like the society has wronged him and the society is responsible. Such kind of subtle ambivalences Ambiguities are very common in modernist novels. Relationships are strained and ambivalent. That is the theme of To the Lighthouse also. But before I talk about To the Lighthouse, I have to tell you a little bit about another book that is based on Mrs. Dalloway. Michael Cunningham. Have you heard that name? Michael Cunningham wrote the novel The Hours where Virginia Woolf is a character. Mrs. Dalloway is also a character, author, character, and then one reader, Mrs. Brown, who is reading Mrs. Dalloway. Author, character, reader, all are characters in the hours. It's a Booker Prize winning novel by Michael Cunningham. To the Lighthouse came in 1927. Stream of consciousness, nature, Symbolism, relationships, people unable to belong and psychological depth, spirituality, same formula as the other novels that we talked about. To the Lighthouse is set in Hebrides, which is an archipelago or a group of islands near Scotland. Mr. and Mrs. Ram say their six children, their friends are all getting together in a summer house in Hebrides. And what happens then? That is the theme of the novel. 
the novel is divided into three parts the window time passes and the lighthouse these are the three parts and here in the first part there is a party the guests are all getting together and uh, they are unable to have a good time because there is fighting there is misunderstanding their ideas do not match ill feeling is bred but the all these people are somehow brought together and united by mrs ramsey she is like a unifying factor something happens on that day little bit mrs ramsey's son james wants to go to the lighthouse visiting but mr ramsey thinks it is not safe we are not going there james is very disappointed so that is like an objective correlative of the impossibility of desire the impossibility of uh, communication and relationships the trip to the lighthouse doesn't take place the second section time passes is happening 10 years later the first section is just one day slow movement of time time passes as 10 years compressed into a few pages so time is fluid sometimes expanded sometimes compressed in these 10 years a lot of these people die including mrs ramsey when these people die when mrs ramsey dies that becomes a very important indication of how time changes everything this changing of time passage of time is indicated by the waves that are relentlessly crashing the waves keep coming without stopping you know when you look at nature you see a lot of things like that sometimes the wind the waves as long as i was speaking there was a bird making a sweet sound repeatedly without stopping i was noticing it i don't know if you noticed it has stopped now i said the bird and the bird understood we are talking about it so it stopped anyway that reminded me of the relentlessness of time time doesn't stop for anybody it just goes on and on and on and on the waves crashing against the summer house of the ramses in the hebrides that is a symbol of this time passing the ramsey house becomes dilapidated in the third section the lighthouse that trip to the lighthouse is taking place but james the 6 year old boy is now 16 years old everything has changed their father also has changed and in the first part of the novel the artist lily brisco one of the guests she was trying to complete a painting she was unable to do it but in the last part she is able to do it she completes the picture because she gets like a complete picture of life life is not easy life is not clear and complete but it is beautiful it is possible to make sense of it this subtle meaning is the crux of the novel to the lighthouse our desires our destinations our dreams may not ever be fulfilled perhaps we may not remain on this earth to fulfill them but just to dream to live this short life the way we are doing it is so beautiful these relationships however imperfect they are however traumatic they might be are still beautiful so this unbelonging is a beautiful way of belonging to this world do you understand these are some of the reflections that the novel leads to amazing novel very great novel and at the end when lily brisco completes the painting 
we get the idea that art is perhaps the solution. The only surety in this world is art. Everything else changes. And after this, she wrote some darker novels. The darker novels of the 1930s are not very romantic or easy to read. They are disturbing novels such as Orlando, a biography. It is a story of a man who turns into a woman and lives hundreds of years. It's a fantasy. Orlando is a man at the beginning. Later he turns into a woman. Both the man and woman are poets. And uh, he writes Ethelbert, a tragedy in five acts. He writes the oak tree. He lives from the Elizabethan period, that is when the novel begins, down to the 19th century. Characters like Pope, Addison, Swift are all there in the novel. And this novel was based on Virginia Woolf's lesbian friend, Vita Sackville West. So, it is a novel that casts relationship and life in completely new ways. Following which, Virginia Woolf wrote The Waves. The Waves is a completely unconventional novel. Presenting the story through six characters' points of view. Six characters, their stream of consciousness, sensations are forming the novel. It has been described as a prose poem because it's prose but very poetic. After writing the very difficult serious novel, The Waves, Virginia Woolf did an experiment. At this time she was reading the love letters of Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her husband Robert Browning. And they have a Caucasus Spaniel, a dog, whose biography Virginia Woolf wrote, Flush, a biography. And then came another very major novel, The Years. It is her longest novel. It has been called a novel essay. The bird is again relentlessly calling. We know time doesn't stop. You also don't stop. So we were talking about the years. Interestingly, the chapter divisions in the novel are names of years. The novel follows the upper class Perjitar family. That is the, those are the protagonists. The novel begins when the characters are young and progresses as they grow older. Virginia Woolf's last novel was Between the Acts. It was published posthumously after she died. She died of drowning, committed suicide. The acts refer to the two world wars. And it's a very imaginative, mature novel. The acts also refer to a play that is being enacted in a village. Now, Virginia Woolf is not only really a novelist. She was a very major essayist. Virginia Woolf's essays show remarkable insight into contemporary life and the literature. She also talked about women's issues. As you might know, a very major collection of her essays is called The Common Reader. The title The Common Reader came from Dr. Johnson. The common man reads without prejudices, without preconceived notions. That is why Virginia Woolf also called her book The Common Reader. I already mentioned her essay Modern Fiction where she reflects on contemporary uh, fiction. And she prefers the insight into character to depiction of social reality. She says what we need is insight into character. There are also other essays like the modern essay, how it strikes a contemporary, professions for women, etc. So many essays that are important. I will tell you a few more names. Please read uh, and make notes on your own also. Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, that is also very relevant. It is there that Virginia Woolf famously said, on or about December 1910, human nature changed. A very dramatic way of putting it. She talked about the beginning of modernism. There is a posthumously collected, uh, collected work of essays, book of essays called Moments of Being. It is posthumously collected essays. 
Now, as you all probably know, there is a very important book, non-fiction book by Virginia Woolf called A Room of One's Own. 1929, Room of One's Own. 1949, Second Sex. 1969, Sexual Politics. All three milestones in feminism came like 20, 20 years apart. A Room of One's Own is like a feminist Bible. She was going to give a lecture on women and fiction. And uh, this lecture she was going to give at two colleges, Newnham College and Girton College. And when she was doing research, she realized that there isn't much material on women writers. Women's literature, women's writing is kind of um, blank. Nothing much has been written about it. So she is embarking on a gyno critical practice of writing the history of women's literature and women's writing. And she writes about women writers. What women writers need is independence, a room of their own and 500 pounds to live on. She wonders what would have happened to the sister of Shakespeare if, if he had one, Judith, the sister of Shakespeare, would she have become a great writer? No, she would have gone to London, somebody must have made her pregnant, she would have committed suicide. Women do not get to establish themselves as professionals because of the patriarchal society, because of the lack of freedom they have. What women need is independence. There is a sequel to a room of one's own called Three Guineas. She is talking about people writing to her for various uh, causes, war, women's education, etc., asking for donation. And in that context, she is talking about these issues. So, that is in a nutshell all the works of Virginia Woolf, amazing writer. Please read on your own, get to know her style, and enjoy. I'll be back with another video very soon. Bye bye, guys. Until then, happy reading.